Um, we had talked about the fact that you can't uh, put down. Are you on? You ready? We talked about the fact you couldn't put silicon chips down bigger than about a centimeter on a side. And the reason for that, you can hand this hand this around. I'll keep one copy. Um, the reason for that is, as you have one one uh, material of dissimilar material with different coefficient of expansion on top of another material like the table, as the linear dimension of that gets greater, the strain energy or the residual stresses gets larger. In fact, here's the mathematics of it, if you will. Uh, I can put it up, up here on the, uh, the overhead. But this is, for the axisymmetric mo model, the uh, um, total strain energy, if I've got this right, yeah, okay. The total strain energy goes, there's a, a constant coefficient out here. This is just the radi ratio of the electric, uh, elastic moduli. This is actually the average, the geometric average of the uh, Young's modulus of the two different materials, A and B. There's the um, cha difference in the coefficient of expansion squared. So if you have two materials with a large difference in coefficient of expansion, that goes, the strain energy goes as the square of that. The temperature difference goes as the square. For the axisymmetric case, which is basically a, uh, a plane, um, it goes as the width cubed, and then the error function of the height to the width, and that's what some of that is. You don't have to worry about that. Um, but in fact, the bonding strength goes as the area, which is basically proportional to the width squared, but the strain energy goes as the width cubed. So you're increasing the strain energy by at least that linear dimension. You've got one more, uh, this, you know, three is greater than two by one. Um, and so you have a increase in total amount of elastic store, uh, strain energy stored in the material as you go to uh, larger and larger sizes. And eventually that strain energy gets so large, well, actually here's the other one I should have used. Um, eventually, that's, this is the first page. If you're doing plain stress, it's width squared, but the bond energy in plain stress is just um, goes as the length of the bond, and so you still have one more dimension. If you go axisymmetric, then it's width cubed, but the area goes as R squared. So you always have one more dimension in terms of the strain energy than you do for the uh, uh, bond, bond strength, and therefore as you get larger and larger, the residual stresses start to dominate the strength of the bond. And it just turns out for brittle materials like ceramics or like uh, semiconductors, silicon and gallium arsenide, about a centimeter is about as big as you can go. And that also, when we get to brazing, um, that's also true if you're trying to put uh, ceramic cutting tools. I mean, when you, when you machine, high-speed machining today, uses ceramic cutting tools, but you have to back them up with a piece of steel because they don't have very good strength and tension. They're in compression when you're cutting, but they gotta be backed up by a, a good strong piece of uh, a ductile material. Uh, and typically, about the largest braze joint you can get on a ceramic cutting tool is about a centimeter as well, maybe a half an inch on some of those ceramics. But just in general, you have a hard time bonding uh, materials that have um, big differences in coefficient of expansion uh, and get very large areas. And so that's, there's not a good way to stick a two inch, even just a two inch, much less a foot of ceramic on top of a metal. Uh, when I brought in the uh, uh, turbine blade, and I guess I can bring it in again, but the turbine blade that had the ceramic coating on it, they have to spray that first with a powder which has some, intentionally leaves some porosity, as an, they call it an undercoat, but it's a metallic powder, and then they spray the ceramic on top of that. So you get both mechanical interlocking uh, type of adhesion of the ceramic with the porous undercoat, but the porous undercoat has porosity in it, and that helps absorb some of the strain between the ceramic heating and the base material heating. So you got all kinds of problems with residual stresses when you start putting dissimilar materials together uh, in a 
uh, thermal environment. Okay, any questions? Any of that? We talked about adhesives. They vary widely in cost. Their water resistance and their uh, corrosion uh, properties. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about corrosion, um, but in fact, particularly if they are if they are susceptible to water intrusion, then you you can have some significant corrosion problems. And I did mention before when we talked about encapsulation of semiconductor chips, um, and I may have may or may not have shown this. Uh, one of the things people did, if you take the tab tape uh, and you bond it, this is on the tab tape, uh, you basically squeeze on some, some adhesive as an encapsulant to protect the uh, semiconductor chip and the leads. And this is the cross section. Here are the leads coming off. Here's the encapsulation on top of the chip. Um, about 10 years ago, I think I mentioned that there was a, a big project between digital equipment and IBM and somebody else, maybe it's Intel to look at better encapsulants that were, uh, these are just basically polymer adhesives that had less susceptibility to moisture diffusion through because it doesn't take very much moisture when you've got wires that are only 25 thousandths of an inch. Or not 25 thousandths, 25 microns or one 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 thousandths, one one thousandths of an inch in size. It doesn't take very much corrosion to destroy the joint. So. Um, there's, there are significant problems with adhesives uh, with moisture absorption. And in fact, one of the things that makes things expensive is when they go to uh, water resistant adhesives tend to be things that uh, have to be made by a chemical engineer in a chemical plant. That makes them more expensive. Uh, we talked about adhesive joints being good in fatigue because they distribute the stress, uh, but they're variable in corrosion. They also require something I didn't mention yesterday, um, but they require a large surface to volume ratio. Uh, you, can, you can't, well, typically if you're, if you're a parent or an older brother or si sister and a small child comes to you and says, you know, my, toy bro my plastic toy, toy broke, can you glue it together? And they want to glue it together like this. Well, you know it doesn't work structurally. It just doesn't work. I don't have enough area. Now, if I could glue it together like that, okay, and get a lot of uh, area, the problem with adhesives is they're Vanderwaals bonds. You're lucky to get 5,000 psi type of strength in most adhesives. In most cases, you're talking something like 1,000 or 2,000 psi type of strength. And so even the plastics, which broke because they had 10,000 psi of strength, you know, they're just not going to cut it when you, when you try to glue something, butt something together like this. You need lots of surface area. So you need to bond sheets together. Plywood's an example. Or fibers. Fiberglass is an example of an adhesive, bonding fibers together. Or powders, if you will. Asphalt is an example of particulates, aggregates uh, bonded together with a bunch of tar, basically. So you need... Um, powders, fibers, or sheets, you don't usually want an adhesive bond big, heavy, bulk materials because you just don't have enough surface area. You're just not going to get the strength that you need. Um, so those are the last things on adhesives. Any last questions? Yeah. Well, they're usually better in shear stresses because usually you've got them with the large surface area. The problem with the normal stresses is they tend to fail in peeling. I mean, it's like take scotch tape, right? Um, how do you remove scotch tape? You don't lift it straight off, you peel it off. And, it's, and you're just stressing one part at a time. So peel strength is a, um, there are a number of standard tests for peel strength of, uh, of adhesives. Because they, in tension, they, they tend to fail not in tension, but by peeling, which is basically a a type of shear. If they're loaded in shear and you don't have that peeling which concentrates the stresses at, at one edge, then they actually are pretty good. And that's why they have they, they distribute the stresses very well. And that's basically because they have a low modulus and they're surrounded by material with a high modulus, which means they are the flexible thing that gives. Unless you end up with a brittle ceramic, not ceramic, but uh, brittle uh, I'm just to me brittle ceramic is just just kind of rolls off the tongue because there is no, no other type of ceramic. Um, but uh, a, a brittle adhesive, 
crazy glue cyanoacrylates are actually fairly fairly brittle. They're they're strong. They appear to be strong for the reasons we said yesterday, but they can be very brittle. But if you get enough bonding area, then it doesn't really matter. You distribute the stresses fairly well. Other questions? Okay, let's talk about diffusion bonding. Which I haven't written anything up here, but if you remember kind of the, the theme I tried to bring up before is you've got surface contamination and surface roughness as the two things that are inhibiting any type of any two materials from just sticking together when you when you squeeze them together. Well going back to this type of model, in cold welding, which we've been through in excruciating detail, which includes friction welding and ultrasonic welding and stuff, uh, basically you're going to get larger contact area and break down the surface disparities and remove the contamination in most cases by just sh mechanical shearing. Okay, You need a shearing action. Squeezing straight down doesn't work. Um, but you basically get rid of both the roughness and the contamination by just, in most cases, large sliding distances, except ultrasonics where you just bury the contamination and ultrasonic uh, welding is, is uh, marginal in many cases. Um, now, in adhesive bonding, we had a special application where we didn't remove the contamination, but we ended up, we interposed a liquid, typically. That got rid of the surface roughness, and we just used something with a lower surface energy than the contaminant that's on the surface. Now, you know, adhesive bonding, if I put grease on something and then try to glue it, it's not going to bond very well. You want it to be clean. You want to get rid of the grease because the adhesives are going to have low surface energies on the order of 30 to 60 ergs per square centimeter. If you start putting grease on there that has a similarly low surface energy, the, the adhesive doesn't want to displace the grease. And so you can't stick scotch tape to a, a greasy fingerprint, right? Um, so you want to be clean with adhesives, but you don't, you don't remove the surface oxide. But you do interpose a liquid, and that liquid has a bond, but it has a limited bond strength. Now, let's think of another way. Another way, uh, we're actually going to come up with two other ways. Um, the first one we're going to do is diffusion bonding. And diffusion bonding, basically, you're going to squeeze it and add heat. And the heat does two things. One is it, it helps to form those surface disparities, right? Remember the surface disparities, you can't get more than about one third area of contact by just straight, straight, straight down squeezing. However, I add heat, I can get better than one third. And I also can get diffusion, even if I could only get two thirds, I actually can get the material with the heat to actually diffuse and fill up those voids, and we'll talk about that. That's basically similar to sintering in powder metallurgy, if any of you have ever heard of that. You also are using the heat to diffuse away the surface contaminants, okay, by, in certain cases. Not all cases, but in certain cases. So you can think of diffusion bonding as cold welding with heat. You're going to squeeze the thing. If you do get some, you, we don't usually in diffusion bonding have to add significant shear, but we are going to squeeze the thing together and add heat. And the heat does two things. helps to form the surface disparities and it hopefully it doesn't work in all materials it diffuses away the surface contamination Now, uh, examples or an example of diffusion bonding. Uh, this is, I may have passed it around before, this is a, or two pieces of titanium sheet that were milled together. They're basically mirror images and then pressed together 
they were actually welded on the end. And these actually also, we'll talk a little bit later, probably, probably had some internal gas pressure to kind of blow this up like a little bit of a balloon at the same time you're squeezing from the outside. But this was, this was a test diffusion bond joint for one of the airfoils for the F-22 uh, fighter. Okay, so they were trying to build a new engine. They wanted to make hollow titanium airfoils so you can see the shape of the airfoil. This is going to be one of the big inlet blades. I mean, this blade, I don't know, maybe a few feet long. But this is just the cross section of it. Uh, it's diffusion bonded at those little, at all the, the interfaces. You can just draw a line straight through there. That's the interface at the center. Uh, and they basically just squeeze these things together. And of course, you have at each one of those on a microscopic scale, you have the, the surface disparities. Um, there are several reasons. Uh, they can put, want to put holes in there. They can put holes in there uh, in some cases because they're going to have gas cooling. Another reason for the holes is just to lighten the weight. This thing's going to be spinning at you know, you know, 18,000, 10,000 RPM. Uh, so you want to reduce the stresses, you want to make it lighter. Um, I remember back many years ago, this is back uh, during the Vietnam War, and I worked at a Naval Air Rework Center as a, as a co-op student. And uh, some of the inlet ducts had, uh, were titanium. They were smaller, but they actually filled them with rubber for some reason. And I, I, I remember we had, I had to do a weld repair um, on uh, one of the titanium inlet ducts. They had finished assembling the whole engine, and they found a crack. And so we, we were going to have to weld repair this in place on top of the, you know, even though it had rubber inside it, and even though it had to be stress relieved, we weren't going to be able to do any of that because they needed these engines back in Vietnam. Um, and so uh, I was this little 19 year old uh, uh, co op student. And so I was given the responsibility to be the engineering eyes for this repair, which was a kind of a, uh, a unauthorized, well, it was authorized. We were authorizing it. Um, and the Navy can do that, uh, but it wasn't something that the engine manufacturer, in this case, uh, Pratt & Whitney, had ever authorized. In fact, they had a repair procedure. You had to disassemble the entire engine, go back and cut this whole disc and vein. This is the stator veins. Cut the whole thing apart. It would have been two months worth of work to repair this crack. So my boss basically decided that we were going to TIG weld it, grind it, peen it, and sign off on it. And I remember I had to go out there and we had to watch the guy. We developed a peening procedure where it basically just hammered the surface to remove the residual stresses because ordinarily you'd have to do a heat treatment. But we couldn't do that because it had the rubber inside. Plus it was inside the whole engine. You couldn't heat treat the whole engine. So we were going to mechanically stress relieve it. And so I went out and we, the guy was basically holding this vibrating tool and we were doing little things called almond gauges, which is just a little strip of metal and you beat on the surface and you measure how much it bows because you beat on the surface. If you beat on the top surface, it actually springs up because you introduce compressive residual stresses on the, on, the, on the top surface when you're beating on it, which means when you release it, it basically bows up. And you measure the bow up height. And so this guy would go as reproducible as he could on the test pieces and I would measure the height and there was, it was all over the map. So we were not getting a consistent process. Okay, so I go report to the boss. The boss says, who's got 40 years repairing jet engines, he says, okay, let's go with it. <laughs> so, um, so I go out, and I now have to witness the repair, right? Because this is, a, this is kind of a special repair, so I have to witness it. And I, I witness the guy weld it, and, uh, and then I see him peen it, and I say, yeah, it looks like just like he peened it just like he used to, you know, same, same variability. Um, um, and I go in, and my boss puts this sheet of paper in front of me and says, uh, sign here. And he had already signed it. And I said, well, what does it mean if I sign this? He says, if this plane goes down, you'll be in jail in 24 hours. I said, okay. So I signed it. <laughs> so, of course, I think that, that's been 30-some years now. So I think that that engine is probably out of service and I'm probably safe now. But nonetheless, I remember it was not the most comforting thing he could have told me at the time. Um, but I signed it anyway. Even though I didn't know as much about fracture mechanics then as I do now. Um, but in any case. Okay, so we, we want to deform the surface and diffuse away things. Now it turns out we also have to try to avoid 
in all of this brittle inner metallics that can form. For example, if I were to take nickel and aluminum, two common materials, I can diffusion bond those together. The problem is I get a nickel three aluminum or a nickel aluminum at the interface that can be very brittle and that can be very harmful. Um, I can get around some of those problems by interposing something else. In this case, I could put nickel copper aluminum. It turns out nickel and copper don't form inter any intermetallics. Um, aluminum and copper do form an intermetallic, but if I pick the right copper alloys and the right, right aluminum alloys and stuff, I could potentially make a diffusion bond by interposing something, a foil in between, that prevents an intermetallic from forming. So I can, I can play some games to avoid getting brittle interfaces um, at my, in my joints. Um, the problems with other problems with diffusion bonding is you eliminate prior thermal mechanical treatment. Now why do I call it? I call it that complex name because that's what industry calls it, TMT. Quite often, and whether it's a aluminum alloy or a steel or whatever, uh, I've done some special things. I've heated it up, I've quenched it, I've raised it up again to a temperature to form precipitates. I've uh, rolled it at a certain temperature range so I can form certain preci precipitates. And all of those different Rolling, or rolling it or heat treating it or combinations of the two are all kind of lumped together as thermomechanical treatment. And I do those things so I can enhance the properties of the base material. Unfortunately, in diffusion bonding, I'm going to wipe out most of that. And the reason for that is diffusion bonding, um, the bonding temperature is typically between six tenths to eight tenths of the absolute melting point. That's in Kelvin. So, um, and the reason for that is I've got to be at a re relatively high temperature if I wanted to form these surface disparities. That's my number one thing up there, right? I want these things, I want the heat, I want to be at a high enough temperature that I can get these things at reasonable pressures to deform. Now, what are reasonable pressures? Typical, typical bonding pressures are 500 to 5,000 PSI. Now, the, the metal might have 50,000 or 100,000 or 150,000 strength, but we know as we heat things up, they'll get weaker. I want to do bonding at a pressure where these things are going to, um, to soften. Now, it turns out 500 is going to relate more to 8 tenths, and 5,000 is going to relate more to, to 6 tenths, right? Lower temperatures, I have to use more stress. So there's a trade-off here. One of the problems is how do I fixture these things with 5,000 PSI pressure? And if I've got a really big part, 5,000 PSI pressure is a lot of tons. That's two and a half tons per square inch, right? So if I have very many square inches, I've got some serious problems. Um, if you do the homework problem, uh, you'll, you'll see uh, one, of the, one of the problems is to estimate um, some, it's a fairly simple problem, but estimate the, the deformation of the asperities in the world's largest uh, diffusion bonding press. Turns out Mitsubishi Heavy Industries in Hiroshima, Japan, Hiroshima, I think it's Hiroshima, has a diffusion bonding press. It's in the whole, it's in the problem. I haven't looked at it for a while, but it's something like, um, it's a few meters by a few meters. Uh, it might be 10 meters by five meters or something like that. And they're basically making clad plate. Same type of thing as, as um, uh, explosive bonding, making, uh, putting one dissimilar material on top of another, but they're using a diffusion bonding press and I think it's, 
either 10,000 or 20,000 metric tons. That's a big press, okay, to bond a, a large area. And you've got to calculate what the pressure is. Um, anyway, you have to go to a high enough temperature that the material creeps. Um, and it ter typically, metals don't creep, don't deform over time. By creep, I should have brought some silly putty, but uh, silly putty creeps. You put a ball of silly putty on the table and you come back the next day and it's a pancake of silly putty. It crept overnight. It's slowly deforming. It has, visco it has a lower viscosity. Its viscosity may be 10 to the 6, okay, rather than 10 to the 10th. It could be 10 to the 4th if you go to a high enough temperature. If you melt it, it'll be 10 to the 1, okay, but, or, or 10, to, 10 to the 0. Um, but as you increase the temperature, the viscosity goes down and the thing creeps. Um, a professor, someone who used to be a professor here taught mechanical behavior when he taught the creep class, he would start an experiment at the beginning of class. He'd take a piece of solder wire, it's just lead tin solder, and he had a little ring stand and he would load up the wire with a little weight. Now this weight might be a one pound weight, and he would show the, the length of the wire at the beginning of class and half an hour into class, the wire would have crept by about a half an inch. Okay? And that's because lead tin, in terms of its absolute melting point, it turns out the melting point of lead is just so happens to be 600 Kelvin. Okay, 273 plus 327 uh, centigrade. So if I'm at room temperature, half of the absolute melting point is 300 Kelvin. It turns out for lead tin, tin melts at 212. So in that case, he was probably putting 5,000 or 4 or 5,000 PSI. He was probably for the lead tin alloy, he was at about six tenths of the absolute melting point. Okay, just to use a, a lead wire or lead tin wire. Uh, for that. If I'm dealing with um, iron, we've got 1600, so the absolute, the melting point absolute is going to be about 1850 Kelvin. So at 300 Kelvin room temperature, I'm a long way from any creep regime. I'm only 20% of the uh, absolute melting point or, or less. Uh, so for steel, in order to start softening it and having it creep, I've got to be at temperatures something on the order of 600 to 700 degrees centigrade because that's going to be roughly 900 to 1,000 kel uh, Kelvin. Now, it turns out I stress relieve steel by heating up to 12, typical number 1,200 Fahrenheit. Well, what's 1,200 Fahrenheit? it's about 650 centigrade. And I lose half the strength. And if we want to talk about the World Trade Center, when people talk about, well, the beams got hot from the fire, and as they got hot, the steel lost its strength. Steel loses half of its yield strength at about 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. A good hot fire like that can get to 12, 1,400 degrees on gen in general. So basically that's what caused the, the beams to buckle, was the heat. Uh, and what that we talked about how the rest of it, but you can use these types of numbers and run through and figure out what temperatures you're going to do this. So if you're going to diffusion bond steel, you're going to have to be at six, seven, eight hundred degrees centigrade. Now the problem is if you go much higher, you start getting if you go to the high end of the range where the, the stresses are less, you start getting grain growth, and the problem with the grain growth is basically. Uh, you have a handout of this, but uh, it's the right spot. The problem with grain growth is it destroys the ability to get rid of the pores. And there are, in fact, three stages of diffusion bonding. If I start out with, and I realize this isn't really big, but you have a handout. This comes out of the welding, one of the one of the only things worthwhile out of the welding handbook, the old welding handbook. Um, you have the grains. These represent the grains. You have an interface here, and these are the asperities where it's contacting. Okay? There's a few, few little spots right in here. As you, so that's the initial asperity contact. As you squeeze it together, you will now have an interface, and that's that 
black line coming through here. And as you heat it, these, these pores, these big pores over here will shrink because the metal's diffusing. The atoms are moving around, rearranging, and because they want to lower their surface energy and decrease the size of the pore by diffusion, these things will get smaller and smaller. They tend to be congregated around the central grain boundary, or the central inter original interface, which is a crystal boundary, and you can treat it now as a grain boundary. As you keep on heating, this is, so this is first stage, this is second stage, second stage, Basically, as the grains start to grow, the grains will recrystallize as the material anneals itself, and you've re gotten rid of your thermal mechanical treatments that you might have put in it. Uh, the, the material grows, and the crystals grow across, and you get rid of that. some of those. There's one boundary remaining, but over here you don't have one, and you actually trap the pore inside the grain. If you go to even higher temperature, the third stage, Basically, you completely eliminate that initial interface that had the contamination. So there's no longer an interface with the contamination, but I'll have a pore here. If I have very many of those pores, then I'll have run into problems. And I'll essentially have a perforated interface, and that's obviously not going to be as strong. So it turns out grain growth, this recrystallization process, is enhanced as you go to the higher end of the, the, the melting range. You don't want to get to stage three. What you want is to stay in stage one and stage two as long as you can, because that's when you're diffusing away the contaminants. That's when you're shrinking, shrinking the pores that are still at the interface. What they've shown here is this pore got trapped without going through bulk diffusion equations and stuff. It's well known in sintering of metal powders and in diffusion bonding that if you trap a pore inside a single crystal, you can, diff you can heat it forever, and you'll never be able to diffuse out all, all those. You'll never be able to diffuse atoms in or vacancies out. And so that becomes a stable defect that heat will not eliminate by itself. So what you want is it turns out at grain boundaries, when the crystals have different orientations, you can annihilate vacancies. You can't annihilate vacancies in the middle of the crystal, but at a grain boundary, which is, are these black, black interfaces, you can. And so, therefore, these is essentially, uh, essentially diffuse away, but this one, which got trapped inside a grain, will still be there. So you don't want to get stage three. You want to stay in stage one and stage two as long as you can. That means you want to be down here at the low end of the temperature range. However, for mechanical fixturing, you want to be at the high end of the temperature. You want to, you want to also be down here at the low pressure, which means the high end of the temperature range. So you've got a trade-off between the cost of fixturing these things and the ability to heat treat it at a short time um, uh, and get uh, defect-free joints. Okay. Now the other problem is some materials are just not diffusion bondable. Because they have two stable and oxide. And aluminum tends to be one of those materials. We don't do a lot of diffusion bonding of aluminum. Aluminum oxide melts at 2,000 degrees centigrade. Aluminum metal melts at 660. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get rid of it by squeezing on it. Um, aluminum also does not, the aluminum metal does not dissolve oxygen. So you've got a serious problem here. Where is the contamination going to go? You can't diffuse away aluminum. This is true for both aluminum and magnesium. Their oxides are very stable. The metals do not dissolve oxygen. And so diffusion bonding basically doesn't work okay, for either one of them. Not very well. I'm not saying that you won't find some cases. Uh, I've done diffusion bonding of some aluminum alloys. But you have to do something like interpose a copper layer and the copper will dissolve the oxygen. And then some of the copper will extrude out with the oxygen, some of the copper will diffuse into the aluminum, and it will increase the solubility of oxygen in the aluminum. So you can get rid of the aluminum oxide. Uh, magnesium oxide is very, very difficult to get rid of. Aluminum oxide is very difficult. There's not a lot of diffusion bonding of aluminum done in the world. I'm not saying it's not done, but it's rare. Yep. Typical times for uh, 
these types of things, if I'm at six tenths of the absolute melting temperature, I might be at 100 hours in a furnace. If I'm looking at eight tenths, I might be looking at 10 hours in a furnace. You gotta remember just a ballpark number for a small furnace. I mean, a small furnace in an industry which is the size of a small car, you know, can hold a reasonable number of parts, is $1,000 an hour. Now, I'm not talking an air furnace, we're talking about a vacuum furnace usually for, for something like this. So you have to be talking about high value added parts, okay? Because if you're, you know, you could be talking um, $100,000 just for if you were doing the diffusion bonding. Um, so you're talking aerospace type of technology. You're not talking, diffusion bonding is not generally used in the automotive industry. You gotta have high value added parts. Yeah, yeah and that's called transit liquid phase diffusion bonding. We're gonna get to that in a few minutes. If not today, we'll get to it tomorrow. So yeah, there, there are tricks and that also, can redu reduce the diffusion time to an hour. And so more and more people are going to transient liquid phase diffusion bonding. So that also gets rid of the need for pressure, okay? I mean, well, I'm just talking about solid state diffusion bonding now, which people have been doing for, commercially have been doing for 30 or 40 years. But because you're talking long times in the furnace, heavy fixturing, a lot of the fixturing is kind of clever stuff where you take a steel component and and put it on top of a titanium component because they have differential coefficients of expansion. Basically, you can design the fixture so that it's just thermal heat that's doing the squeezing on the part. Okay, so you could take a ring of steel and put it around a complex titanium disc for an aircraft, and you, so you have this big heavy steel part, and it's not the weight of it that's creating the pressure, it's the thermal expansion mismatch between the parts as you heat them up, that's creating the stress. But you know, now it's not just a, a garden variety piece of steel, because you, know, the, the, you're, you often are, are not just talking about a piece of steel, you're talking about a special piece of stainless steel that doesn't lose its strength at high temperature. Or in some cases, you're talking about a piece of molybdenum, which has got a very high melting point and will not creep at any temperature for these things. That piece of molybdenum could cost you $10,000. Okay, just for a relatively small piece of molybdenum because it's going to cost you what, 10 bucks, 20 bucks a pound, and you got to machine it and everything else. Uh, but there are tricks that people use like that, um, depending on geometry and stuff. It's not easy to, to get these types of 500 to 5,000 psi pressures. However, you can make parts with diffusion bonding um, that you cannot make any other way. This is this is a forging. We'll talk about later. But, and this is obviously some sort of uh, forging for some compressor or, or turbine or whatever, but there are lots of turbines that kind of have a, um, um, an axial flow in and a radial flow out, okay? I mean, if you're trying to use a turbine as a pump, you basically have the, the fluid, which can be a gas or a liquid, come in this way, and then it, you know, as it spins, the centrifugal force is pushing it out at higher pressure, right? So there's lots of little pumps like that, but they have to have a top cover that's bonded to them. How do you bond that top cover to something like this? Well, let's say it's a titanium part. If you diffusion bond, if you have, if you have start out with a piece like this, it's machined, it has ribs, and you put another piece on top, and you just squeeze the two of them together, you can diffusion bond titanium to itself very, very readily. One of the advantages for the aerospace industry anyway is titanium diffusion bonds very, very well. And the reason for that, titanium oxide is very stable at room temperature, but in fact, above 900 degrees, titanium diffuses away its own oxide layer. Titanium has tremendous solubility for oxygen, and so the, ox the protective oxide layer at 900 degrees will just diffuse away. Now, that gets to be a problem sometimes in jet engines because if some part of the engine that's only supposed to be at 700 degrees where titanium can operate forever, gets a couple hundred degrees too hot and it diffuses away its protective oxide layer, now I have titanium metal in, in contact with air and you get a titanium fire and the whole engine melts in about two minutes or less. Okay, it's, it's actually less than two minutes. 
it's like a magnesium flare going off. Okay, and so uh, they have had a few engines. You have an upset, and people were pushing titanium to higher and higher temperatures. And you get too close to this temperature where the where the oxide layer starts to diffuse away, and you end up with a, a fire. Um, and it's not just a little fire; it's basically set, like setting off a flare inside your engine. Your engine is the flare, so far as that goes. Okay. Um, But uh, actually, the same guy, Robert Sprague at uh, General Electric Aircraft Engines, used to, he had, he had kind of colorful ways to explain things. His comment about carbon carbon composites, someone here worked in the Tomahawk uh, cruise missile area, didn't they? Or no, someone else has me? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, they have carbon carbon composites, little turbine engines, right? And you can run a carbon carbon composite at very, very high temperatures, which gives you lots of thermodynamic efficiency. Uh, the problem is carbon-carbon composites are eventually going to burn up over time. Carbon burns in air, and you can put coatings on it, but the coatings only last. But a cruise missile only has to last for a couple of hours. It doesn't have to go for 100,000 hours. So you can make carbon-carbon composites, which are basically just you start with woven. I ought to be able to bring some of this stuff in. We probably have some carbon-carbon composites downstairs. Um, but you start out with woven polymer fibers, and then you heat them up, and those fibers now have an alignment to them when they when you burn off all the hydrogen from them and you end up with the carbon that remains. And you can end up with structurally sound carbon. Uh, however, this particular guy from GE Aircraft Engines, who was being, you know, was he didn't believe in carbon carbon composites. He called carbon for jet engines expensive coal, okay? Because um, it burns. Uh, but he was also the guy who says, well, why are we worried about titanium fires in engines? Uh, if we were worried about fires, uh, if we were so worried about fires, we wouldn't build houses out of wood, okay? I mean, you build, you build a house out of wood because you try to design it so it never gets to the temperature where the wood ignites. You can build an engine out of titanium and not worry about it burning as long as you design it properly, okay? It's just when they were pushing the designs, they ran into problems. The, the Tomahawk cruise missile engines, which are carbon-carbon composites, have a limited lifetime, and this is a very special application. Why do you want to go to carbon-carbon composites? I said they operate at very high temperatures. You go back to your basic sophomore thermo in terms of engine efficiency. Well, it's lightweight, that's one. But the other is the higher the temperature you go to, the greater your thermodynamic efficiency. Remember, it's delta T over T, or, or T over delta T, whatever it is. Your operating temperature divide, you know, uh, divided by your, your difference in temperature. So the higher you can go in your, your hot part of your thermodynamic engine, the greater your efficiency. And uh, typically, right now for commercial jet engines, a 50 degree centigrade increase in operating temperature of the engine is worth $2 billion a year to US airlines in fuel, okay? So you're talking real money here uh, when you talk about just a little increase in temperature. And I suspect, I don't know, it may even be classified. I have no, no way of knowing. But typically, a modern jet engine is operating around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, what, 1,200 C or something like that. Uh, a carbon-carbon composite could potentially have hot sections as hot as 3,000 C. I don't know they get quite that hot, but certainly 2,000 C. I mean, you, could, you can essentially double, nearly double the efficiency. Um, of one of these engines because they really operate hot. But they don't have to operate very long, and that's a certain advantage. Of course, it's what, a million bucks a pop? Something like that? Something on that order. Half a million? Only a half a million now, right? Um, still cheaper than a lot of other alternatives. <coughs> okay. Any other questions on those things? Let's see if I cover stage one, two, and three. So we don't want to go, we don't want to get to stage three. And the next topic is, in fact, TLP bonding. Um, and I, I handed out a paper on TLP bonding, and it has a little asterisk in this paper. It's, it's uh, because TLP is a registered trademark of Pratt & Whitney, okay? And as I always point out, that's because uh, Pratt & Whitney discovered transient liquid phase diffusion bonding and patented it in, like, 1972 and they gave it this nice little name, TLP. It turns out other people in the aerospace industry, 
Northrop, I think, and General Electric and some others, had been doing something similar since 1956. Uh, and I do know of a $30 million patent fight that Pratt & Whitney basically lost uh, when they tried to defend some of their TLP patents because there was prior art. But the real prior art was the Etruscans who were using it in 600 BC. Um, they didn't file an infringement when Pratt & Whitney filed their patent. And um, um, they actually were using it to bond little copper be, uh, gold beads to copper swords. Okay, so this was a art decorative technique. And they basically would oxidize the surface of the copper in the fire, put the gold beads on, and it turns out copper oxide was the transient liquid, liquid say, or some, some eutectic or something. There was something that formed there. It may have been a tin. Or they may have had some tin on there. But these little beads were, were uh, bonded to the uh, surface of the, the hilt of the sword these little gold beads by a, a, a transit liquid phase diffusion bond. Uh, people think that um, um, King, um, King Tut's, uh, you know, the Egyptian king in 2000 BC, they think his sword actually was diffusion bonded as well. But no one's been willing to cut it open to uh, find out whether it really, you know, look at it in a microscope. See, so some people have no interest in science. I mean, they just, you know. Uh, but uh, in any case, diffusion bonding, transient liquid phase diffusion bonding goes back a long way. Um, most people think of it as aerospace alloys. It occurs, well, do I want to, it's kind of silly. Well, I won't show you how it occurs until tomorrow, but let me, um, it's back 10 years ago when I was teaching this class, I used to say that TLP bonding was an interesting process that only applied to certain types of materials, uh, and therefore uh, it's kind of limited in scope. But I would say over the last 10 years, there's been a tremendous increase in the number of applications of uh, TLP bonding. And in fact, what we've learned is more and more things that we were doing before that we thought were soldering or brazing ended up being transient liquid phase diffusion bonding. Uh, seven or eight years ago, I had a student uh, from Raytheon look at, for his master's thesis, how to bond silicon chips. He was interested in gallium arsenide um, to, to the substrate. And it turns out the, the, the basic surface underneath this is gold, but he used gold, silver, and copper just uh, for his study. And you can take your ceramic chip carrier or whatever, and you can also make it gold silver or copper. So basically, you're not really bonding gallium arsenide to aluminum oxide. You're both bound, bonding gold to gold or gold to copper. And it turns out that you can interpose tin, which melts at 212 degrees C, or indium, which I think melts at 156 degrees C, or indium tin, which melts at 56 degrees centigrade, if I remember correctly, or lead, or cadmium, or bismuth. I mean, you go over to this area of the periodic table, there's lots of low melting metals. You can interpose those, and if you look at those phase diagrams with these elements, you find they dissolve in each other. So you can solder with these, lead tin is a solder, indium tin is a solder. You can solder with these and essentially hold it. And the student found that he could, with a little two pound force on a one centimeter chip, one square centimeter chip, with only two pounds of force, which is about five or 10 PSI fixturing pressure, just to keep the thing from sliding off on the liquid, because you're gonna have a liquid here, right? You could slide right off it to where it's supposed to be. You, you melt the solder and you hold it in the furnace for an hour. Now, I don't know if we still have it, but we, his furnace was a hot plate and he had taken some uh, wood or something and covered it with aluminum and that was the top of the hot plate. And that was his furnace, but he could control that hot plate with a little thermal controller so within about one or two degrees centigrade. So he's doing this at, let's say, this one, he may have done this one at 75 degrees centigrade. You hold it, you hold the solder there for one hour, and the indium and tin diffuse into the gold or the copper or the silver. And now when he did a remelting experiment, he couldn't remelt it until 600 degrees centigrade because I didn't have a solder anymore. I now had a gold copper 
indium tin alloy, which melts at a very high temperature. And so that's what transient liquid phase diffusion bonding is. Pratt & Whitney has trademark on TLP from 1972. They have not been able to hold up their patents in court because there's lots of prior art. Lots of people are doing it. I once uh, had a problem. Raytheon over here in Waltham called me up and they had a soldering problem. They had these transformers that controlled the control rods for Navy nuclear reactors in subs. And they had put these, these transformers had a little copper shield for electromagnetics and it had a copper wire so they could ground that that was soldered to it. It's supposed to be soldered to it with 95 tin, uh, 95 lead solder, which melts at 300 C. That's because they didn't want to use lead tin solder, the eutectic, which melts at 183, because these things had to go into a furnace to be aged at 200 degrees centigrade. So you don't, you're not going to solder with 183 degrees solder if you've got to operate it at potentially up to 200 C. Well, they put these three things into the furnace, and they looked in the furnace when they took it out of the furnace, and they could see some solder, a little, where some solder had leaked out and had a little pool of solder in the bottom of the, of the uh, heat treatment furnace at 200 C, uh, basically just an oven. And they said, oh, great, because now they're potted up. You can't repair them. They're scrap, and they're worth a million dollars a piece. So they called me over and said, what can we do? Uh, but they explained, we've done some tests. We took these things and we put them in the furnace. We made just some shields with the w copper wire soldered with the wrong solder. Someone, they tra traced it down and someone had used the wrong solder alloy to solder these two things together. They said, we've done it. We stick it in the furnace for 24 hours for the, uh, the aging thing that we have to do under the spec. And we pull them apart and they don't fail until 300 degrees centigrade. So, you know, why? I said, oh. I gave him a copy of this paper. I said, you just did transit liquid phase diffusion bonding. And so I read, basically, by holding for 24 hours with that lead tin solder, melt at 183, it had diffused away and left the 95 tin, uh, 95 lead solder in between. And we were able to, I was able to write a letter, because I'm an outside consultant, uh, to Raytheon, and they gave it to the Navy, and the Navy bought off on it, and they weren't scrapped. So they saved $3 million worth of parts. And I made five, six hundred dollars off of this. Okay. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow. It's not so bad for writing a letter. <laughs>